Hello everyone and uh, welcome to the continuing discussion on the life, works, and writings of Dr. Zerizal. We will have a look back at the historical context of our history so that we can understand better our the, the, the struggle of Dr. Zerizal during his time. So we go back 1519 when uh, Magellan started his his expedition via uh, the ship Victoria and um, of course you know very well that uh, Ferdinand Magellan was on a commission a Portuguese who was commissioned in the service of the Spanish government at that time they were looking for a westward route to the spice islands of Indonesia they were looking for spices but on March 16, 1521, his expedition landed in Humunhon Island in Gian Samar. Um, of course, close to Samar was, was uh, Cebu. Uh, Magellan was the first European to reach these islands. And uh, when he reached Cebu, he was met with a friendly gesture by Raha Humabun, who embraced his... Uh, call or or request for 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 Christianity, because um, Magellan wanted to Christianize the the natives at the time. All of them are cordial, uh, very friendly, except for one chieftain in Mactan, whom we know as Lapulapo. Uh, Magellan sailed to Mactan on the order of. Rahumabun, but uh, he wanted to convert Lapulapo, but it seems that there was an ensuing battle which which led to his death by the natives, so not necessarily Lapulapo at that time. And uh, in the ensuing battle uh, uh, resulted to his death uh, around April 17, 1521. We just have to check the dates class because if you notice our history has been rewritten several times because of so many um, documents coming into light and with this sometimes we get confused because um by by, by these new developments we we can we can also correct our history and correct the books that were written in the past uh, we have to remember that our history defines who we are and it, it gives us identity as Filipino people. So going back to this um, expedition, uh, out, of, out of the five ships, uh, more than 300 who left on the Magellan expedition in 1519, only one ship and 1818 returned to Seville, Spain. So when they return in 1522, uh, the it, it was it was considered as an uh, as an expedition, historical expedition because it was a circumnavigation of the globe, and proved that uh, the world was round. Okay. The master of uh, ship conception took over the expedition after the death of Magellan and uh, captained the ship the name of the ship is victoria back to the spain uh, his name is um juan sebastian de elcan de elcano juan sebastian de elcano uh, he earned the first distinction as the one who navigated or circumnavigated the world in one full journey it took 16 months for Elcano to return to Spain, by the way. And um, it, it almost it almost took them three years to complete the voyage if, if you if you sum up the entire expedition. Of course, Spain has celebrated it the, the return of Elcano, especially King Charles the First, who decided that Spain should conquer the Philippines. Um you know very well that uh, they did not just find spices in the Philippines, but most importantly, 
they found gold. People were wearing gold at that time, according to some historical books. Uh, gold everywhere. So uh, that was one of the reasons why Spain wanted to to colonize the Philippines at that time. Five expeditions were sent to the islands following the route, Rota. Uh, we have 1542, which was a successful one, led by Rude Lopez de Villalobos or Roy Lopez de Villalobos. And 1564, or 65, depends upon the history book, by Miguel Lopez de Legazpi. Only the last two actually reached the Philippines, Villalobos, Villalobos' expedition and Legazpi, who succeeded in colonizing the islands. Um, Roy Lopez de Villalobos Villa set sail from the Philippines, or for the Philippines, from Navidad, Mexico, on November 1, 1542. He followed the road taken by Magellan and reached Mindanao, Sarangani Island on February 2, 1543. Um, he could not stay in Sarangani because of the insufficient food supply. He was the first one who named our country, country as Islas Filipinas or Las Islas Filipinas in honor of uh, King Charles' son, who is Prince Philip, who later became King of the Philippines. Um, of course, since none of the expedition after Magellan uh, had succeeded in taking over the Philippines, King Charles I stopped sending the colonizers to the islands. However, when uh, King Philip, the son of King Charles, succeeded his father in 1556, he instructed Luis de Velasco, the viceroy of Mexico, to prepare a new expedition. This time is to be headed by Miguel Lopez de Legazpi. And he was accompanied by... Father Andres de Ordaneta, the priest who had survived the first mission. On February 13, 1565, Ligaspi's expedition landed where? Of course, in Cebu Island. He struggled with the natives of Cebu. Remember, Cebuanos at that time uh, uh, had, had, uh, had, had, it out, had had it out already with, with uh, the first colonizers. So he was, um, he was not welcomed, so he proceeded to Leyte, then to Camigin, and to Bohol. It was in Bohol that he made a blood compact with a chieftain, Dato Sikatuna, as a sign of friendship. Legazpi was able to obtain spices and gold in Bohol due to his friendship with Sikatuna. So if you can remember the blood compact in Bohol, it's because um, he was not welcomed in Cebu, Miguel Lopez de Legazpi. But Legazpi returned to Cebu, so he was really interested with our, with our, um, with our place, with our province. He destroyed the town of Rahatupas and established a settlement. So he forcefully conquered Cebu at that time. And on the orders of King Philip II, there were 2,100 more men arriving who arrived from Mexico to help build the port of Fuerza de San Pedro. So when you build, when they built um, Fort San Pedro at that time, it meant that it, it's a stronghold that they conquered the place already. It became a Spanish trading outpost for them, something like that. Hearing the riches of Manila, an expedition of 300 men headed by Martin de Goite left Cebu for Manila. So there was a group of people again who probably have heard that oh, well, there is a better place. They found the islands of Panay and Mindoro. They were able to conquer this place as well, these provinces. But Goiti arrived in Manila on May 8, 1570. May 8, 1570, were they welcomed? They were welcomed first by the natives and formed alliance with Raha Sulaiman. Uh, Sulaiman was a Muslim king, but the locals, the people around, uh, the people in Manila, sensed the true objectives of the Spaniards. So they were already wise, no? They are uh, not easily fooled by these uh, 
by these uh, foreigners. So a battle was ensued between the troops of Suleiman and the Spaniards. Because the Spaniards are heavily armed, the Spaniards were able to conquer Manila. Soon after, Miguel Lopez de Legazpi joined Goite in Manila. So he left Cebu. Legazpi built alliances. However, since Goite is very uh, aggressive, Legazpi's way is, is, is like a PR, PR guy. He was very... He was very mapiar, um, uh, or how do you call that? He was very good in terms of public relations. He built alliances and made peace with Raha Sulaiman, with Raha Lakandula, or Lakandula, and Raha Matanda. So three Rahas that uh, that um, ruled in Manila at that time. So in 1571, Legazpi ordered the construction of the walled city of Intramuros and proclaimed it as the seat of of government of the colony and the capital of the islands. In 1572, Legazpi died and was buried at the San Agustin Church in Intramuros. And then in 1574, Manila was already called a distinguished and ever loyal city of Spain by King Philip II of Spain. So you may be asking why the Philippines is easily conquered. There are roughly possible reasons like the, the natives at the time lacked unity and there was no centralized form of gov government at that time. Although the barangays were already functioned as units of governance, each one existed independently of the other and the power of each dato was confined only to his own barangay. So kanya kanya. No higher institution, not even a united barangay, um, was established. And this was uh, taken advantage by the Spaniards at this time. Um, they used the barangay that were friendly to them in order to subdue the barangays where people are not really friendly. So they took um, friendly barangays against each other. So you remember that uh, the Philippines was under Spanish colonization or Spanish colony for 333 years, dating back to 1565, so not 1521. So we will, we will antedate it to 1565 until 1898. So Spain was, uh, was a far country from the Philippines. The king ruled the islands through the viceroy, V-I-C-E. ROI, uh, ROI of uh, Mexico. Uh, Viceroy of Mexico because uh, Span uh, Mexico was also a Spanish colony at that time. Uh, when Mexico regained its freedom in 1821, the Spanish king ruled the Philippines through a governor general. So it's like the president, a special government body that oversaw matters, everything pertaining to the colonies, assisted in uh, assisted the king in in his in his behalf uh, people call it the council of the indies overseas council ministry of Co Co colonies it was uh, it it was implementing the decrees kasuguan uh, no from uh, from from spain and um, it also exercised legislative and uh, judicial powers like like we have right now so what was the political structure? So Spain established a centralized colonial government in the Philippines. It was composed of national government and the local governments that administered provinces, cities, towns, and municipalities. So with the cooperation of the local governments, the national government maintained peace and order, collected taxes, <laughs> collected taxes from our own people, and then they built schools and other public works. The king's representative and the highest ranking official in the Philippines is called the Governor General. Uh, he sees to it that the royal decrees and the laws coming from Spain were implemented in our country. He has the power to appoint, he has the power to dismiss public officials, except those personally chosen by the king. He also supervised the government offices and the collection of taxes. So he can also make laws because both uh yeah both legislative and executive powers 
were under the governor governor general uh, power there was also what you call the residencia the residencia was a special judicial court that investigates the performance of a governor general who was about to be replaced so the residencia uh, was usually a member uh, he, he a member of uh, um, a member of the group uh, he submits report to to the king then you have the um, visita the visita is a council of indies in spain uh, they sent vis vistador general or vistador general to observe the conditions in the colony uh, he will report also to the king you also have the royal audiencia uh, it serves as an advisory body it's like the presidential advisors something like that and then they also have what provincial government the spanish the spaniards created local government units lgu to facilitate the country's administration there were two types of lgu at the time the alcadia and the Corregi corregimiento the alcadia led by the Al alcalde mayor uh, govern the provinces that have been uh, fully conquered or subjugated the corregimiento corregimiento headed by corregidor governed the provinces that were not entirely under the Spanish control. So they were trying to to uh, encourage everyone or they were trying to influence everyone to be under the Spain, uh, the Spanish government at that time. So this, this the, the, the Alcalde Mayor represented the Spanish King and the Governor General in their respective provinces. So they managed the day-to-day -day operations. Of course, each province was divided into several towns, pueblos, or they call it the pueblos, headed by gobernador Silios. Uh, the main concern was um, effective governance and tax collection. So they were good at tax collect collecting, collecting taxes from the, the, the Filipinos at that time. Uh, of course, to show to show gratitude to to Miguel Lopez de Legazpi. Um, he was he was uh, he was given the the designation of uh, incomiendero, no. And uh, he was instructed to divide the Philippines into large territories called incomiendas uh, to be left to the management of designated incomienderos at that time so of course um there, there are there are reasons why the spanish wanted to stay in our country and one of these is the galleon trade when the spanish came to the philippines we are already trading with china japan um, thailand india cambodia borneo and the Molucas Islands. The government of Spain continued trade relations with these countries. They did not stop the relations. And Manila became the center of commerce in the East. The Spaniards closed the ports of Manila to all countries except one, Mexico. Thus, the Manila and Mexico, uh, particularly Acapulco, established the the galleon trade the route to Gal the, the 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 galleon trade itself it's actually uh, the trade is actually a monopoly um all all goods that come from different places from china japan sea uh, siam thailand before they if they board it on on galleon trade descended to to acapulco mexico from acapulco mexico down to cuba from cuba to United States, something like that, and they were distributing it. So it allowed what um, free flowing of goods, uh, five hundred thousand pesos worth of goods, uh, spending one hundred twenty days at the sea, and then uh, it's 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 going back and forth at the time. It allowed 
liberal ideas to enter the country because people can can board on galleon trade so some of them can go to other places some filipinos can go to other places and that is also the reason why they were not able to exploit our natural resources why because they were busy making profits with the galleon trades but uh one of the one of the landmarks in the Philippine history could be the reforms done by Governor General Jose Basco E. Vargas. He instituted he instituted the Filipino farming and trading and then uh, allowing uh, dependents or implemented the general economic plan as, as you would say. The general economic plan is to make Philippines self-sufficient. So it's like giving incentives uh pabuya or how do you call it? incentives is what um incentives are uh, rewards to farmers for planting cotton spices sugarcane they encourage he encouraged under his governance he encouraged miners to extract gold silver and copper and rewarded investors for discoveries also during the spanish the tobacco 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 industry was uh, placed under control uh, during his time, the Governor General Basco. In 1781, there was a monopoly of tobacco. Uh, it was implemented in Cagayan Valley, Locos Norte, Locos Sur, La Union, Isabela, Abra, and uh, yes, Nueva Ecija. Each of these provinces planted nothing but tobacco and sold their harvest only to the government at pre-designated price, leaving little for the farmers. No other province was allowed to plant tobacco at the time. The government exported the tobacco to other countries and also part of it to the cigarette factories in Manila. It raised revenues for the colonial government and made Philippine tobacco famous all over the Asia, all over Asia at that time. So, but then again, um, exploiting the tobacco farmers. Let's go to the secularization controversy of the um, priest, two types of priests that serve the Catholic Church. Uh, there are two types. The first are the regular. The second one is the secular. The regular priests belong to the religious orders. Their main task was to spread Christianity. Examples were Franciscans, Recollects, the San Jose Recoletos, uh, Dominicans, the Augustinians. The secular priests did not belong to any religious order. They were trained specifically to run the parishes and were under the supervision of the bishops. Now, on, the conflict only began when the bishop insisted on visiting the parishes that were being run by, yes, the regular priest. It was their duty, they said, they, they argued even to check on the administration of these parishes. But the regular priests refused these visits, saying that they were not under the bishop's jurisdiction. They threatened to abandon their parishes if the bishops persisted. In 1774, Archbishop Basilio Santa Justa decided to uphold the diocese's authority over the parishes and accepted the resignations of the regular priests. He assigned secular priests to take their place since there were not enough secular seculars to fill the vacancies. The archbishop hastened papaspas an ordination of what? Filipino secular priests. So November 9, 1774 provided the secularization of all parishes or the transfer of parochial administration from the regular priests or regular friars to the secular priests. Of course, the regulars resented the move because they considered the Filipinos what? Unfit for priesthood. Nganuman. Our brown skin, our lack of education, and in that inadequate experience are the reasons why we cannot become priests. So the controversy actually became more intense when Jesuits, katang mga Jesuito, returned to the Philippines. Uh, they were exiled because of certain policies. The issue took on a racial, um, racial problem, and the Spaniards 
uh, favoring their own regular priest over the Filipino priests. But Monsignor Pedro Pelaez, ecclesiastical governor of the church, sided with the Filipinos. Unfortunately, he died in an earthquake and destroyed the Manila Cathedral. Uh, the, 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 he died in an earthquake uh, that destroyed the cathedral in 1863. After his death, other priests took his place in fighting for the secularization movement. Among them are Father Mario Gomez, Jose Borgos, and Jacintos, Jacinto Zamora. Uh, they are called the uh, Gomborza. The reason why Rizal made and dedicated his first novel, No Limitangere.